Hi, welcome, Annika. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, it's great to be with you, Leslie. Yeah, yeah. So uh, where we start is the beginning, which is uh, I love to hear your experience of a spiritual life or religion growing up. How is it presented to you? And or how did you take that in or think about it growing up? Yeah, thanks. Um, it's so interesting to kind of go back in time and um, presence those early memories. And, you know, I, I kind of find like there's a couple of veins that are there, a couple of them. I, um, I grew up in Eastern Oregon where you are and um, was spent a lot of time, you know, out in nature with my horses down at the pond, looking at, you know, tadpoles and pollywogs and cattails and, you know, making mud pies in the backyard. And so I think when I feel into my kind of innate natural spirituality, it was kind of those experiences that I had in nature where I felt my most, most natural self and most in kind of communion or what we might even say oneness is. And I think that continues to be, you know, a through line for me today. In fact, like a couple of weeks ago, I was like, I just need to be, go home and be on that land. My soul needs to feel that kind of resonance. And so I remember, I remember having a strong sense of spiritual awareness and my own essence in that period of time. At the same time, my family was Episcopalian. And so there was um, going to church and all the kind of ritual of that. I was an acolyte in the Episcopal church and, you know, wearing all the garb and holding the, the you know, cross and marching up the aisle. And I remember being up in front of people and kneeling, I think, as an acolyte. And I remember passing out a lot. Like I'd get up there and I would be passing out. I'm not exactly sure all of what that was. but um, And that felt a little bit more forced. And to be really transparent here, I had a stepfather that was a lay minister in the church who was also very abusive. So it was a very uh, interesting dichotomy because I think I had this inborn, innate love for um, Jesus and not necessarily Christianity, but Jesus and the sacred heart and the kind of mystical core of the teaching of love and action, even as I was young. But then to have, um, to, to be in a church where somebody that wasn't who he said he was, um, it was so confusing. And then also standing beside my mother who would be singing, you know, all things bright and beautiful, kind of from the neck up, very disembodied. Um, and me feeling like what I really wanted to see were a bunch of ugly, mean things. Like it was hard to reconcile my experience to the spirituality that I guess really, truly felt more disembodied to me. That might have been why I kept fainting. <laughs> like, oh, I can't hold it all up here. <laughs> There's something more here. So, you know, that, coming back to nature, you know, I think that's where I felt safe. That's where I felt attuned. That's where I felt met and reflected to. Um, and I also remember, you know, I think that one of the things that growing up in a really harsh environment drove me to is I had nowhere to go except inside and to the divine. Mm. And so I remember going into my room and my room was kind of my sanctuary with my stuffed animals and I had a piano and I love doing art. So I spent a lot of time connecting with myself and the divine deeply, deeply inward. It, it drove me to those places. And I remember, you know, pounding on the, on the, um, the piano keyboard and singing. Um, I think it was Debbie Boone's You Light Up My Life, like over and over and over again. I, I think probably trying to get some of that light in or express that connection to the light. So there was some confusion early on around religion and other people, but I wasn't confused when it came to my own deeper connection and, and with, with God. I mean, that sounds so beautiful that you were able to, regardless of kind of what was going on around you, you had these threads 
this art and the music and the nature and these threads that were grounding you. And when you said that the religion was disembodied, it, that sound, it, it feels like truth. Yeah. Right. It just feels like so much. That's one of the issues. So many of these are from the neck up, you know, disembodied. And I, I, I really honor that description. And, um, and it's amazing to me that you, you know, it's not amazing, but it's this little kid reacted, was reacting to the, to the, to the yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And not knowing what to do with my experience. Like my mother looks beautiful, sings beautiful. There are beautiful words, but I don't feel beautiful. Why does she, and what, why is he at the front and okay, I'm going to be good and wear these robes. And then, you know, the fact that I kept fainting, like it was a kind of a common experience that I'd have just totally just passing out. Interesting. Uh, and I do, I mean, even as we're talking about it now, I can feel like I was really trying to lift out of my own body and just live up here and I would get, it was just too much. Yeah. 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 So how did this shift over time? Was this something that, I mean, was this like in your awareness that this was a spiritual practice or this was like, this felt good. And so I'm going to honor nature and I'm going to honor these things where the other things did not feel good. I mean, how did that, how was that for you? Yeah. I mean, I think it started so young. It was, you know, I, I remember when I was in seminary, um, some of my spiritual teachers were telling me that I was born without a veil. I was born very, very open and in that direct connection. And, you know, different things came in, but could never really take me out of that. It actually just reinforced it. So it wasn't really like a cognitive decision. It was just more about like, this is how I was made. And that's what was available to me. Um, and it continues to be foundational. I, mem I remember in my, um, when I was ordained and, and graduated seminary that I said, you know, my, my spiritual life is like a tree. It's like the roots are deep in direct experience, like nature, like art, like music. Um, and then the core is like the mystical core of Christianity. And then the branches are like all the traditions and the leaves are like creativity. So, I mean, I really still feel, feel that kind of tree of life that I, is my own embodiment of my spirituality today, what informs me. But then I had other really interesting experiences too. We had a Bible study in our home. So it was the first experience I had of people gathering in circle and sharing. And I remember I got to sit in that circle. And I remember as a little girl, in some ways in my priestessness, before I'd be, go to bed, like partway through the Bible study, I, it was my bedtime. And I remember like at five years old in my PJs going around and kind of hugging and blessing each person, like really deeply wanting to connect. Mm. Um, and that still feels true today. You know, I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah, it's interesting, though, because when we started that conversation, I had the idea that, that the church wasn't something that was fulfilling you. But now I'm hearing, you know, pieces that were fulfilling you. Yeah. So, so tell me how, tell me about that. Tell me how, how did you get from disembodied, right? Mm -hmm. And, and the hypocrisy of, of the elder um, to wanting to go to seminary? Yeah. And I don't know if that's jumping way too far in advance, but it's a, you know, yeah. For some reason, even though, how would I say it in this moment, like trying to tease those apart, I think going to church, going to the Episcopal church and hearing some of the teachings, the truth of the teachings and the beauty of communion and what it meant to like embody that Christ consciousness, I think at an intuitive level, when I was young, something felt really resonant and true for me in that. And I could take that in and it went in. The confusion came around other people and how to be in true relationship with others in that experience. And that's, that's the confusion. Um, so it was very much kind of a personal and somewhat isolated experience I had. Um, but that, that continued to be 
you know, a through line um, for me, that, that grounding in the kind of mystical Christian and Christ, Christ's teachings. Um, and then you go all the way to when I answered the call to seminary. Interesting enough, it was back, um, back in Central Oregon again that I went. I was living in Seattle at the time, and it was right after 9-11. And I had this experience of being, you know, in my condo on Queen Anne and had this company, I was consulting with all sorts of different organizations. And after 9-11, I remember looking out at my life and looking out at Seattle and it felt like everything had just died. Like my life went to ash too. Like nothing felt meaningful anymore. And I remember saying or writing a poem and said something about, I'll do my part to heal this and that led me to like put all my stuff in storage and I went back home and I sat in prayer and in meditation and did art and my grandparents happened to be there at the time and in an assisted living home so I really sat at their feet quite literally with them and I remember finally one day my parents were having a um, cocktail party and I couldn't stand to go downstairs and answer the question, what are you doing with your life? Like what's, what's next one more time. So I, I got in the shower and I remember I had kind of a headache and I remember just sitting down in the shower, just pounding down on me and just saying, you know, God, you better fucking tell me, <laughs> what do you want with me? Like you can't have taken me this far in my life. And so I was like, this and um, and really within a couple of few days I um, heard go to seminary and I was like what <laughs> and I remember the one conversation I had with God at that time was um, do you want all of me not just from the you know head up the waist up like all of me and it was like yes all of you so that might have been in April, and I think by June I found myself in, in seminary. I just, um, you know, I've been doing this podcast for a while, and the interesting thing, this, all of our heroes' journeys, right? The Joseph Campbell in us, and, and to listen to it, and, and to hear that something happened, and that it's just, I, I so honor that you listened. Yeah. Right? that you stopped what you were doing and said, something's got, I need something and went to the land, right? I'm from Santa Barbara and Santa Barbara's just had a big mudslide and it's in a lot of pain. It, that land is sacred. It's where I was born. It's where my father died. And that land is sacred to me mm. and I have a connection to it. Mm. And just, I honor that you got to do that. And also the elder, right? Sitting at the feet of your elders and how important that is. And then, you know, I, I've many, many times been, tell me what you want me to do. Make it really loud. Right. <laughs> and then when it comes down, you're like, Oh wait, what? <laughs> like That's what you want, you know? And, and I just, I really honor the fact that you listened so deeply. You took that time. You got quiet. You, you, you mended yourself, right? And took the leap of faith. Because that's yeah. not, from what it sounds like, it's not what you were doing prior. No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I had just completed my master's degree in applied behavioral science. I had gone to spirituality and health and medicine um, course, year-long course at Bastyr. I had become an expressive arts therapist. But really, I was... I could say that it was like one of those times where my worldview got bigger. Like before it was me, my family, my community, those that I was connected to. And then there was something that broke open that said, wow, what's going on in the world that this would happen and a desire to serve. Mm. And yeah. So tell me about now. I don't know if that's too much of a leap, but so that, uh, so now you move forward and we're 20 years, 17, 18, whatever years in. Um, where are you today? How is this for you today? How things, have things shifted or things like, where are you? I mean, are you a minister? That's not what you actively do, is it? You know, I, um, yeah, I think once you're <clears throat> a minister and ordained, probably always that bent. But 
aside from, <clears throat> I do marry people and have also done many memorial services, especially in this last year. Um, but I don't actively show up and preach on Sundays anymore, do the New Thought Circuit anymore. Really, there was a, <clears throat> a moment when, you know, right after seminary, I spent many years in Coffee Creek Correctional Facility working with women, um, working with women for about three and a half months right before they were released back out into the community. And so doing deep healing on emotional and spiritual levels and preparing them to, to reenter. So that was really, really profound work. Yeah. And, you know, I wrote a book, book with James Twyman called um, The Proof, 40 Days for Embodying Oneness. And that really came after being, you know, in uh, a retreat. I got guided into a personal retreat for 40 days. Um, and that was really profound. And, but there was this moment when I was sitting with a colleague from Nike and he said this, I'm looking at who you are and this experience in consciousness and the experience you have in business belong together. And so that's when kind of this ministry went more to how I show up in, in organizations. And that's when Awake at Work and my work at Intel was born kind of out of that conversation and other things as well. So now it feels like um, before spiritual, spirituality in some ways was a ritual or a thing I did to now it's really about how to just embody it every moment and in every action. And I've kind of come full circle though lately in some ways just back to my roots in, in earth and art and music and the core of the mystical teachings of Christianity. And just that ongoing kind of praying unceasingly especially as we're faced with so much uncertainty and complexity in the world right now um, and such rapid change that really tuning in and listening to that inner guidance, you know, like that channel has to be, at least for me, where, where I tune and, and take instruction from. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. And I, I love that you're taking the, this work that you've done and the spirituality into the workforce. And I think that um, personally, I, I could never understand why it was. I mean, I guess why I understand why it's not, right? It's so complex and you have such a variety, but it's also the working, you know, corporations are these this mere, I don't know how to put it, but like a mere family, right? And you're there. These are people you're spending the most time with, right? And all of your life plays out in reflection with these people and, in with, and, mm -hmm. and to get a consciousness of that, to, to get a deeper like acknowledgement of it. Yeah. You know, I was, a, I worked at this one corporation and I would go to the exec team meetings and I was not an executive. And finally, I, I couldn't understand why I was there. And, uh, but my boss was the CEO and he wanted me there. And, and finally we did this Myers-Briggs and the entire exec team had zero feeling. And I was the only feeler. And so I would sit in these meetings and just be like, oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing to each other? And, and they didn't, they felt it, but they didn't know, they couldn't figure out what was wrong. And it was so clear. And so to have consciousness brought into this space is such beautiful work. And can you tell me a little bit of how you do that? Right? Yeah. Well, the, the Wake at Work program, as it's designed, is a nine week kind of arc. Um, and so generally there's a, a cohort of people inside an organization, you know, 35 to 55 people that come in and we go through this nine week experience together. And the first three sessions are really helping people to learn how to turn within mm -hmm. and connect with their own inner landscape and their own presence. So the first three sessions in different ways, we're working on developing that capacity. Um, the next three sessions are more like, okay, then how do I show up in relationship to others? So we start to move into emotional intelligence and relational intelligence, uh, mindful listening, 
we start to remember that most of the time, a lot of our brain power is like constantly searching to, am I, am I safe and do I belong? Am I safe and do I belong? And how to put those, um, those fears and those questions at ease so we can actually connect with each other. Mm. And we do some teaching around vulnerability and shame from Dr. Brené Brown. So for the next, the next three sessions, middle sessions are really how are we connecting with each other? And then the last three are, how are we participating in the larger culture of the organization? How are we collaborating? How are we embodying the values? And how do we stay sovereign with ourselves and our own voice and creativity and not just kind of fall into the trance of the organization as well? So those nine weeks is really how it flows. And then I also do a lot of work with teams and groups within organizations as, as well but that seems to be like a way that people can begin bring, bring some of this practice in yeah 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 because i you know one of the reasons i like this conversation is that my spiritual life is how i move like how i make decisions it's it of course it's at work how would it, i don't understand how it's not you know not in work and and um and then i think that that corporations can get sick when they disembowel that piece, right? And, and people too, right? The whole system. And, and so the healthiness of just like saying, let's talk, like we're people, you know, like let's acknowledge our humanity here. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and so I really love that. And so I guess the question I have for you today, because it's feeling pretty complete, is how does your, I think we talked about this a little before we push play, how does your spiritual life, how does, how does it show up in your daily life, right? What is it, how is it practically, how do you practically use it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ah. One of the one of the practices you know that I turn to when you ask that question is I've been studying with a teacher called uh, her name is Judith Blackstone, and she really teaches how to really inhabit our body and inhabit ourselves, not just use the quality of awareness, but to to realize the whole body is conscious, and how to tune into the body, and. Um, tune into different qualities there, the quality of our intelligence, the quality of our voice, our love, our power, our sexuality, and our stability. And so the more that I kind of do that, like a lot of times I think people think the spiritual path is up and out, and that is one direction. And I've been doing, you know, down and in and more relational. And that's where all the friggin' complexity is. Like if I'm just up and out, I can bypass a lot of my neuroses and my challenges. And if I'm not embodying it in my relationships. So I have to say that it feels more like grit right now. Um, Like just being with my own lived experience, my own fears, my own shame, um, you know, my own unknowing myself as I start to look at, um, white supremacy and racism and privilege and start to unravel that in myself and what I have to face there. So there's a lot of, a lot to be faced and to also be coming forward with freeing up my voice from my family's wanting to keep all the abuse quiet and suppressed and glossed over. So, you know, part of my practice is like, I have to be pretty rooted in my own presence just to meet on an emotional level, all of that experience that I have and kind of rewire. So it shows up very much in the trenches that way. And then it shows up too. And like, how am I able to be with people? How am I making choices about how I show up and, and connect and who I'm connecting with and the clarity of my communication and the clarity of my boundaries. I mean, to me, this is where the rubber hits the road in the spiritual path. Um, Like, how am I really loving myself and loving others? How am I putting that love in action and standing up for women of color and facing my own um, internalization of white supremacy and racism? So that's where 
it's not all like chanting and not that there's anything wrong with that, but it, that's, not, that's not what it's looking like over here. And right. now I feel so much and want to go to the store and like get the cookies and like numb it all out. Do I just breathe and stay present and eat, you know, some blueberries? Like it's, it's all of that terrain right now for me. And it, and it does take a, a grounding in my own embodied presence and, and a lot, you know, prayer is what it's looking like. Thank you. That. No matter what happens with the podcast, I needed to hear what you just said mm. deeply. Mm. And um, I've just been doing work and one of the people, the, the work is not bailing when things get hard. Yeah. I'm just like leaving my body, which is what I've done. It seems like the smart thing to do. Like it really, and yet the power is like my body is something that informs me. And, you know, I've always talked this idea of like, yeah, I'd rather go sit in a cave in the mountaintop. Like that's way easier mm -hmm. than be in relationship with others. And I just started this social work and it's hard yeah. I, th to sit and witness what I as a white woman have done to women of color and to people of color is really hard to face. Yeah. And it, the defensiveness that comes forward and the like, what did you, I didn't, I didn't, why didn't you? And just to, to, to allow, like to stay and witness someone, someone's anger towards myself. Yeah. And it's just so messy. It's just, it we were talking about white fragility and I was like, I am totally fragile. Like I just get so, but like, oh God, I get so painful. And yet learning how to take care of myself, step in and show up. Yeah. For that conversation and to to witness other people and and um yeah it it resonates with me so like the work today for me is getting in my body yeah and not not jumping to the gut like it's eat, I don't, it's so hard to for me to still say the words right but um yeah. but that's the new work Mm -hmm. for me and I I um I just I honor that that you're doing it and I um it is it is some deep <laughs> deep learning it is. I think we as a society pay no attention to the body other than what it looks like right yeah. it, and not as a you know the feelings and the thing so yeah that is it's hard and I'm I I just um Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. I think one of the beautiful aspects of this practice of inhabiting our bodies is that all those fixed patterns are up in our heads. So if we're just inhabiting our lives and running our lives from the surface of ourselves and in the head, instead of settling back into the back core presence and settling down, like that's where, where some real movement can happen. But it is, it's, um, it's messy. Like I said to somebody, it feels like all this stuff is just like, the awakening is just like, and just splattering stuff everywhere. And the ability to stay in it without collapsing. And I think there's a difference between fragility where we collapse and blame and when we are having an authentic experience of emotion that we need to actually digest so we can get to a deeper truth and a deeper power. And yeah, that work is not for sissies. <laughs> yeah, and I just, I, and, and if you're listening to this podcast and don't know this work, um, there's, a, there's a podcast called Awarepreneurs that is, has for me been incredibly helpful. And um, so yeah, so in, I just wanna give a plug to anyone that you think could help people who are like, what are they talking about, white fragility? What are they talking about? Yeah. You know, who do you who do you know of in that space? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I would recommend Lisa Renee Hall and her oh. Patreon account, and she does work in helping us inquire into oppression, 
how we're both oppressed and oppressors and unwinding white patriarchy and whiteness. She's amazing. Um, Desiree Lynn Attaway has something called Freedom School, some similar work that she does. Um, I'd recommend also Judith Blackstone, who teaches the realization process, one of my teachers, to help you inhabit your body. I'd recommend connecting with me because I help especially women learn to inhabit more of their feminine intelligence and their leadership and also start doing this unwinding process. It's really like white women need to do some of this work with other white women, um, unless we're paying and honoring teachers um, that are women of color. And then I'd also um, support another woman, um, Abigail Rose, who um, is also holding space for white women to un un unwind and unravel this um, piece. And so the, the two trains that I think are really important for us to be paying attention to right now on the spiritual path, on the spiritual maturity um, is, you know, how do we unwind oppression and racism? And then also how do we strengthen our connection to ourselves and our core and our true self and embody more and more of that? And like both of those, those um, pieces happening simultaneously to me are integrity. Yeah. Beautiful. And I'll make sure that in the notes that all of these ways to get in touch with these people are going to be there and links. And some of them um, are going to be on my podcast. So Lisa, I think is going to be on my podcast. I haven't done it yet. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, is there, this feels complete to me and I just want to check in with you. Is there anything that I've missed or is there anything else you would like to say? Thank you for your presence and your curiosity and for holding a space for me to kind of go back to kind of the beginning and bring it current. And um, yeah, that in itself feels like a healing transmission. So yeah, thank you so much, Leslie. Yeah, anytime it is. This is my... My work of joy, I, I very, it's needed in the world. So thank you. And uh, you will find all of the connections on how to get a hold of her and the people we have talked about in the liner notes at uh, coachlesley.com forward slash podcast. Um, and yeah, so thank you until next time. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. I will.